Coming up on this episode of This Week in Linux, we have some big Linux gaming news from GOG.com and Valve, and app news updates from Wireshark and the Tor browser, GNU PG announced a crowdfunding campaign, and KDE Connect has something really cool on the horizon. This week we saw quite a few distro releases from Bodhi Linux, Chaos, and Rosa. We got some cool updates from the GNOME team, including how Canonical has been working with GNOME to improve many aspects of it. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital, and you're watching This Week in Linux, your weekly source for Linux GNUs. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by me with a shirt I made. The shirt reads Linux is everywhere, and I made the shirt because I wanted it. And I thought others might want it too, so the purpose of the design is to celebrate the proliferation of Linux. Linux is so widely spread that it is very likely everyone uses it every day, whether they know it or not. The concept of the design is to have Tux blended into the background to convey the message. Even if you aren't aware that Linux is there, it probably is. If you're interested in supporting the show, or if you just want the shirt, then you can order it at the URL on screen. You can also find the link to the order page in the video description. First up in app news this week, Canonical has been working for some time with themes inside of desktop snaps. And during this process, they have created platform snaps. One of these platform snaps is for GNOME 3.24, which will allow for GNOME apps to be packaged as snaps. The part that makes this really cool is that these GNOME app snaps will be usable on Ubuntu 16.04. One of the things that always bother me about GNOME apps is they don't package any of the apps themselves, leaving it to the distros to do it. This is a problem because it means that all GNOME apps are version locked from at least six months to it as long as two years, depending on which release of Ubuntu you use. This new platform snap for GNOME 3.24 allows for snaps to be made and used regardless of the Ubuntu release you have. Of course, Ubuntu 17.04 will have these packages up to date anyway, so they aren't really needed for that release. However, while yes, Ubuntu 18.04 will have the up to date packages upon release, it will be an LTS, and therefore these apps are not likely to be updated like it always has been. That's okay though now, because these platform snaps and these GNOME app snaps should cover 18.04 LTS as well. KD Connect is one of my favorite applications on Linux. So much so it has become an integral part of my computing workflow. KD Connect has announced this week that they currently have beta support for using KD Connect over Bluetooth rather than Wi-Fi or your local area network. In my personal usage, I prefer to use a local network like Wi-Fi because it fits me well, but it doesn't work that well for some people. For example, if you are someone who travels for work or likes to work in a different place, such as like a coffee shop, it's not really a good idea to use these kinds of public Wi-Fi, so Bluetooth support allows you to use KD Connect regardless of which network each device is using. I personally would still prefer to use a local network, like tethering my phone to my laptop, but adding Bluetooth linking will certainly add an extra level of convenience for many people. The GNU PG project has announced this week the launch of their fundraising rally. This is to help fund the continued support and development of GNU PG. There's a somewhat odd thing about this, though, with their crowdfunding campaign, and that is that GNU PG is not using Kickstarter, Indiegogo, Patreon, or any of the other crowdfunding services. Instead, they're using their own custom method of collecting the funds. This fundraising rally is kind of a combination of both Kickstarter and, with the one-time funding and Patreon with a monthly subscription funding structure. It appears that while a lot of people are interested in backing this crowdfunding campaign, most are only doing the one-time donation approach. Their goal is to raise 15,000 euros on a monthly basis and also accepting one-time donations for an undetermined amount of time. While this is a rather odd approach to crowdfunding, it seems to have some success already with over 2,400 euros in the monthly pledges and over 18,400 euros in one-time donations. Microsoft has announced that the native Linux Skype app will be officially deprecated on July 1st. This was inevitable as it was announced a few months ago, but we didn't have a date back then for it. The Electron-based Skype for Linux app is still in development and has a lot of the same features. Unfortunately, there are a few features missing like screen sharing, but it is expected that these features will return in time. There are many alternatives to Skype these days, and I've not had a reason to use Skype in years. So, for example, audio-based conversations are great with Mumble or Discord. Video conversations are a solid experience with Meet.Jitsi or Google Hangouts. In fact, Meet.Jitsi supports screen sharing, including support for specific window sharing rather than just the entire screen. 
Native Linux Skype is almost dead and the Electron Skype is not as featureful, but thankfully Skype becomes more and more relevant every day. Now if we can just convince those stubborn friends and family members to use something else. Wireshark is arguably the most popular network analyzing tool available, and the latest version of 2.2.7 has been released, so go forth and analyze. Tor Browser version 7.0 was released this week, adding a lot of interesting features. 7.0 updates the Firefox base version to Firefox 52, adds support for multi-process mode, aka electrolysis, and content sandboxing. Another new feature is that Linux users now have the option to further harden their Tor browser setup by utilizing Unix domain sockets. The Windows version of 7.0 does not support content sandboxing yet, while the Linux version does. It's kind of nice to see the reverse sometimes. For those of you unaware of what the Tor browser is, I'll briefly explain. Tor, aka the Onion Router, protects you by bouncing your communications around a distributed network of relays run by volunteers around the world. It prevents someone from watching your internet connection from learning this, what sites you visit. It prevents the sites you visit from learning your physical location, and it lets you access sites which are blocked. The Tor browser makes it much easier to use the Tor network because everything needed to use it is already set up beforehand. Google Chrome 59 and Chromium 59 were released this week, including quite a few bug fixes. But the most notable change to mention is the browsers now will be using GTK3 by default. GTK3 development for the Chromium stack has been in the works for years and has been available for beta users for a while now, but 59 is the first stable version to include GTK3 by default. Basically, it's going to make Chrome and Chromium look more integrated than before. A new version of the Mate Doc applet was released this week, and this update includes many appearance customization options. You can now choose the style for active application indicators, customize the space in between icons, and the option to use an attention badge rather than icons blinking on and off. MateDoc does not provide packages themselves, but Arch users can find it in the AUR, and users of Ubuntu-based distros can use the PPA from the web update team. You can find a link to the PPA in the video description. Last week we discussed the news that UbiPorts moved their bug reports off of Launchpad, and this week Inkscape announced they will be moving their entire development process off of Launchpad over to GitLab. GitLab is a very popular alternative to GitHub, one of the biggest benefits is that it offers the ability to host your instance on your own servers. It also has some other interesting features like time tracking, but that's not really important for this news. I don't think Inkscape and UbiPorts moving away from Launchpad is the start of a trend or anything, because there are many projects that still heavily use Launchpad for development like Elementary OS. Inkscape has been working on a transition from Bazaar to Git for about a year now, so it's nice to see they have settled on which infrastructure they'll be using for the project. In distro news, Bode Linux 4.2.0 was released this week, a little over four months after the previous release. This update adds the Swami control panel by default and upgrades the kernel packages to the Linux 4.10 series. Probably the biggest thing to note about this release though is the discontinuing support for 32-bit processors for the standard version of Bode Linux. However, Bode Linux still offers 32-bit support with their legacy ISO, so if you have an ancient computer that doesn't support 64-bit operating systems, then you're still covered. Although with that said, please update already. It's been 15 years since 64-bit processors came out and have been the standard for over 10 years. There's never been a better time to upgrade because computers are cheaper than they ever have been and even with decent entry-level laptops costing about $250 these days. Anyway. OpenSUSE has announced that Leap 42.3 release candidate is available for testing and is asking for feedback from people interested in testing the next version of Leap. Linux Mint announced the availability of the beta version of 18.2 Sonya, so if you're the kind of person who likes to test out pre-release distros, then give one of these a try, and be sure to let them know what you think to help polish the final releases. Chaos 2017.06 was released this week, with KDE Plasma being upgraded to 5.10, and Qt being upgraded to 5.9. Plus, this version of Chaos introduces support for both Snaps and Flatpaks via the Discover Software Center. Rosa Labs announced the availability of the LXQt edition of the recently released Rosa R9. The LXQt version comes in both 64-bit and 32-bit versions. Canonical hosted a fractional scaling hack fest in its Taipei offices this week. Both GNOME developers and Ubuntu developers were there to work on improving GNOME high DPI support. GNOME has already had high DPI support, but was limited to very large jumps in scaling, such as two times or three times scale. 
The goal of this Hackfest is to work on making it possible to do much more precise types of scaling like 1.4 times. Canonical announced that Ubuntu will switch from LightDM to GDM in the 17.10 release. The reasoning behind this was the amount of work and the time allotted for working on making LightDM work well with GNOME. Honestly, I'm not really sure what the full issues with LightDM and GNOME are, but at the time being, this could be seen as a setback because GDM lacks some key features that LightDM has, such as guest session support. They are working on adding guest session support to GDM, although this might not be completed in time for 17.10, and would be instead a feature of 18.04's LTS. I'm curious as to what the underlying issue with LightDM being used is, because other distros like Antergos use LightDM with their GNOME setup. They said in the blog post, we had planned to try LightDM, and based on our investigations, it became apparent that we would need to invest a considerable amount of time making changes to everything to work correctly, more time than we have. Unfortunately, they don't go into detail as to what changes would be needed to use LightDM. So, it is what it is. This week, Canonical announced that their kernel live patch service is now available for Ubuntu 14.04 LTS. This service used to be only available for Ubuntu 16.04, so it's pretty interesting to me that they backported it to 14.04. The kernel live patch service is available for free for up to three computers, but if you want to use it on more than that, you'd need to purchase the Ubuntu Advantage support package. GNOME's tweak tool released an update this week, which provides some features that Ubuntu Unity users may find useful during their switch. You will now be able to change the minimize, maximize, close buttons from the right side of the window to the left side with a simple toggle in the tweak tool. The other change to note is that users will now be able to toggle whether or not the touchpad is disabled by typing. This doesn't seem like this is at all that important to some people, but if you've ever used a laptop with a very large touchpad, then you will quickly realize how incredibly frustrating it is to accidentally touch the touchpad with your palm, sending you into a furious rage. Okay, maybe I'm slightly exaggerating that, but it is pretty annoying. GNOME also announced this week that GNOME Shell 3.26 will have a translucent top bar that is also context aware of whether or not windows are touching the top bar. If a window touches the top bar, then it will become black. This is very similar to how elementary OS Pantheon DE treats their top bar. I'm not sure if you will be able to remove the top bar entirely like how elementary has it, but this will likely be a very welcome change. Kitty has a lot of releases this week with Plasma 5.10.1, KDE Applications 17.04.2, and KDE Frameworks 5.35.0. KDE Plasma 5.10.2 will release on June 13th, so KDE is cranking out some great updates rather quickly. It was also announced this week that KDE Plasma 5.10 is available to Kubuntu 17.04 users via the Kubuntu Backports PPA. First up in Linux Gaming this week, Open Spades is a Minecraft-style voxel-based first-person shooter available for Linux. And recently it was released as a Snap package, so you can get the latest version very quickly on any distro that supports Snaps. There is currently a massive GOG.com summer sale going on, and a lot of these games support Linux. Here are a few games to make note of that I think are certainly worth checking out. Shadwin, I think it's Shadwin. A third-person stealth-based assassin game is 75% off, making it only $4.29. Mark of the Ninja is a really cool stealth-based platformer that is also 75% off for only $4.49. Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings is on sale at 85% off for only $2.99. And then we have Broforce, which is a really chaotic platformer with tons of character puns like Rambro and B.A. Baracus. Broforce is 75% off for just $3.74. I'll finish this news item off after these next two games, Kerbal Space Program and Trine Trilogy. Kerbal Space Program is 50% off at $19.99, and Trine Trilogy is 81% off for $10.77. One final note is that Trine is an awesome series, and I loved Trine 1 and Trine 2, but there are some pretty bad reviews for Trine 3, just so you know. Okay, I said I was done, but I just saw Firewatch is also on sale, so... Okay, I'll stop now. The 7.1.2 version of the open source graphics stack, Mesa, brings a total of 70 improvements to the stack, including fixes and updates to Vulkan drivers. Speaking of the Mesa stack, Valve announced this week a big update for SteamOS, 
including the transition from AMD GPU-Pro to the Mesa driver. Additionally, this update includes upgrading the base to Debian 8.8 .8 and the Linux kernel to 4.11. Finally this week, Valve announced that Steam Greenlight is officially closed and will be replaced with a new policy called Steam Direct. If you weren't aware, Steam Greenlight was a crowdsourced method of getting games in the Steam library. Gamers could vote on which games should be added to the Steam library, making it easier to get your game in. Unfortunately, this was heavily abused, resulting in many terrible games getting in. But it also introduced some great games like Seven Days to Die, which, by the way, had a new update this week. Anyway, overall, I think this will be a much better situation for gamers and developers because Steam Direct allows any developers who want to release a game to easily get in the library as long as they're willing to spend $100. This $100 is not a fee though, but rather a temporary deposit that the developers will get back once they reach 1,000 in sales. This system should be a deterrent for those abusive developers who just want to release terrible games as fast as possible, but at the same time is low enough that any legit developers or companies wouldn't likely be hurt by it. Before I end the show, I wanted to let you know we now have a subreddit for the show. Here you can leave feedback on the episodes, discuss various news topics, or submit some topics you'd like for me to cover in the future episode. You can visit the subreddit at r slash listweekinlinux, and I also created a subreddit for Tux Digital at r slash Tux Digital, and that subreddit will be for pretty much everything else not related to This Week in Linux podcast, so be sure to check that out as well. Finally, one more shameless plug. If you'd like to help me fund the production of the show, and well, all the content I make on the channel, I'd really appreciate it. Becoming a patron on the Tux Digital Patreon not only helps the channel, but it also gets you a bunch of rewards at even the lowest tier of $1 per month. So if you have any extra money lying around, please consider contributing. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this channel, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux. Linux.